Most people know that Galileo had the first telescope. Well, they'd be wrong. The story goes that the first telescope was made by two kids playing in a Dutch lens grinding shop in the early 1600s. Lenses were pretty new then, and they were mainly used in glasses for poncy people. Now this telescope had a large convex lens out the front and a small concave lens at the back. The light was concentrated by the lens at the front but never reached its focus, but instead got bent straight again by the concave lens so you looked along the rays to the magnified image. The image you looked at might have been bigger but was like looking down a straw so you could only see a small area magnified. The longer the telescope, the more magnification you got. Galileo pinched this idea and changed the lens at the back so it was a convex lens and way further back beyond where the light was focused from the front lens. This telescope magnified just as well, but it had a much bigger field of view. It's still got a few problems, including that the image is upside down, but this is how the refractor telescopes we have today work. Now, modern refractors have short to medium focal lengths, normally between 500 and 1000 millimeters. The really big ones can go higher, of course, maybe 1200. So they're not awesome at magnifying, but modern glass with triplet lenses up front and field flatteners down the back means that they're the best for images anywhere. But I'm biased. They're great for the moon, pretty useless for planets, but they're the best for large nebulas, good for star clusters and fields, and they're amazing for astrophotography and the short ones are best for terrestrial viewing. But they get very expensive when you get a big one. So along came Newton. Now Newton was a bit of a paranoid Fruit Loop, but he was also a genius. He was also the guy who invented doing it with mirrors, you see, Newton didn't like the way a spherical lens worked with different colours, so he ditched the glass at the front of the telescope and put a mirror at the back and shone it back up towards the front of the tube. He then put in a flat mirror to stop him having to put his head in the way of the light and put the eyepiece lens on the side of the tube. It worked a whole lot better than Galileo's telescope, but the image was still the wrong way up. But that really doesn't matter when you're looking at the sky. I mean, who can tell? And mirrors are a whole lot cheaper than lenses to make and maintain. So that's the modern Newtonian telescope. These modern newts have medium focal lengths, normally in the 600 to 1500 millimetre range, so they're pretty good at magnifying. The image quality normally isn't as crisp as a refractor, but the large ones are so much cheaper, so if you want light gathering power, the newt is your go. They're good for the moon. The biggest ones can be okay for planets. Ones with short focal lengths are good for small or medium nebulas, and they're good for star clusters and fields and for astrophotography, but only if you have a coma corrector but they're too awkward to be useful for terrestrial viewing. The problem with Newton's telescope was the same as Galileo's telescope. If you wanted more magnification, you had to build a longer telescope. You see, the basic magnifying power of a telescope is given by the angle of the final light cone just before the eyepiece. A wide cone means less magnification, and a narrow cone means more magnification. This is why they used to build really long scopes. I mean, really long scopes. There it stayed until a priest called Cassegrain designed a new type. He took the basic Newtonian mirror and instead of having a flat mirror at the front, he used a convex mirror that pointed back down the tube and he cut a hole in the main mirror. The convex mirror meant that the angle of the final light cone was really sharp, so through the eyepiece it looked like a super long tube. Then a German optician called Bernard Schmidt added a donut shaped lens called a corrector plate at the front to help the colours focus nicely. So now you've got the schmidt cassegrain types you see in the shop. These SCTs have super long focal lengths, say between 1500 and as much as 4000 millimetres, which makes them supreme at magnifying. If you need a close look, get a cassegrain. They're good for the moon, but only if you want individual craters. They're just about compulsory for planets, but only good for the smallest nebulas and galaxies. They can be good for the smallest star clusters as well. For astrophotography they can also be good, but guiding them can be a major challenge. If you want a scope for terrestrial viewing, look somewhere else. All you're going to see is heat haze with a cassegrain. Finally, a Russian mathematician and a guy with a really sharp haircut called Dmitry Maksatov figured out that you could coat the back of the corrector plate with silver to save money on all that convex mirror assembly. Max are like cassegrains in terms of performance, but don't get so large. Their focal lengths tend to be around 1500 millimeters, which makes them a reasonable compromise scope. Their small physical size makes them good for grab and go scopes. They're just a little bit much for the moon, but not bad. Okay for planets, but they're not great for nebulas as they don't normally suck a lot of light in. They're good for star clusters and fields. For astrophotography, they're okay, but it's not a common usage for them. For terrestrial viewing, they're not bad. The magnification isn't too much. that You'll get too much heat haze except on a hot day. And the fact that they don't get a lot of light in doesn't really matter during the day. In fact, compromise is a pretty good description. They're okay at everything and great at nothing in particular. So we've got refractors. 
Newtonians, Schmidt Cassegrains, and Maxitovs, which is the reason why our showroom is so packed.